we have uh, Alexia Naylor, Naylor from the Cymex store. Um, and Alexia is going to be looking at bed bugs and knowing your pest. Hello. Hello. Oh, I'm a newbie to this, so this is my first time. So welcome to all of you who are also first timers today. Um, and hopefully you'll learn some stuff about bed bugs. Right. Let's see if I can make this work. Right, can everybody see? Yeah, that's up. Oh, hang on, I might have to stop a second. There we go. Right, so just to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Alexia Naylor. Uh, I'm the director of Cymex Store and I also volunteer as the business manager for the Bedbug Foundation. So the information that I'm going to be sharing with you today will come from both organisations. We are run from our little office where I am now um, and we have a lab where we produce bed bugs for scientific research and for the canine scent detection industry. Now, some of you will have heard about bed bugs lots, lots before, and some of you may be new to bed bugs. Um, so I'm just going to go through from the basics all the way through. So hopefully there'll be something for everybody. So bed bugs. This is the family of Semicidae. So this is all of the family related to bed bugs. Um, in fact, the bed bug is this one here. They all have a really similar life cycle. So they all um, infest places where a host, so in the case of a bed bug, a human, where a host comes back to it, to its um, original home or something. So people come back to their beds every night, hopefully. Um, and, um, and these, so we have Martin bugs and we have bat bugs. It's thought that bed bugs started to become parasites of humans when people were dwelling in caves. So these are bat bugs, so Cymex lechularius again, but these are on caves in Africa. And so they hang around on the roof of the caves, waiting for the bats to return, and then they come and feed on the bats. Now, I suspect you're wondering, why am I telling you about bat bugs? Well, it's really important, as we've looked at all the pests so far, for us to understand what our pests are, are like. So what is it that they do? What are they looking for? What are the cues? What's their behavior? Um, and, and these kinds of things, because these are really important in us understanding how to treat our pests, how to find them, and how to ensure that our customers are pest-free. So. Having moved into the dwellings of, of people, um, these are the this is the pest that you're most likely to come across. And so this is the this is the Cymex lechularis. Those of you in the tropics, you might come across Cymex mitris, um, and you might also come across martin bugs as well. Martin bugs don't feed very well on humans. Richard has tried to culture them, but not very successfully. So sometimes we collect those from our own nests on the house. Um, but but Cymex lecturalarius um, we've had in culture um, for nearly twenty years now, and some of the cultures that we have, so the lab strains that lab strains that we have, have been in culture for maybe fifty years. Um, so we start off obviously, as with any life cycle, we've got adults that mate, they lay eggs. Um, there's five nymphal stages, um, and it requires a feed for our bed bugs to go through their nymphal stages, okay? So the generation time that we have in our cultures is about six to eight weeks. So we keep them at about 26 degrees C, which means that we can feed them on a Monday and they'll have gone through their nymphal stages by the following week, which means that we can, with some certainty, produce bed bugs for research to order. Um, 
A female lays between 15 to 25 eggs per week, um, which means that if you've got a mated female that has arrived in someone's house or in a hotel room, um, it's quite easy. It's relatively easy for a female to start an infestation because as soon as you, you know, hotel rooms especially are warm places, they're kept at a constant temperature. You haven't got that hot and cold. Um, and so we've got the, the, the conditions and the environment are really good for bed bugs to increase in population and double their population quickly. Having said all of that, um, I think that in, from our experience, we've done a lot of tests, and I'll talk about that in a minute, is we've done a lot of tests and see, looking at the theoretical model of how many bed bugs, because, you know, 15 to 25 eggs a week, and that, that sounds really scary, uh, how quickly you could have a bad infestation. But the reality is that, that bed bugs sometimes find it difficult to find the right harborages and the right places to establish those infestations. Another important fact to remember is that the that their um, biological zero, so the point at which they stop reproducing um, and stop moving on those nymphal stages, is around 13 degrees. So if you have places like um, chalets um, or holiday lets that aren't open all the time, it's quite possible for you to have bed bugs harboring that may have just overwintered or oversummered, whichever, um, and then come out with the first people coming to visit that particular place. And I'm, I don't know if people have experienced that as hotels have opened up during lockdown. Um, our hungry bed bugs begin, begin um, so a hungry bed bug behaves very differently to a fed bug, bed bug. A hungry bed bug is really motivated by the search for a host. Um, so they'll detect elevated CO2, um, they'll use body heat as a cue, um, and they are photophobic. Now, again, you might be going, well, why is that significant? Well, it means that when you're searching a room for signs of bed bugs, then it's likely that you need to be looking on the dark side. So they'll be away from the window. So you'll often find evidence, not, not equally distributed throughout the room, but actually on that dark side of the room. They're also negatively phototropic. So if you shine a light on the bed bugs, they'll move away from the light. So how do people know that they've got bed bugs? One of the difficult things about a bed bug infestation is that you get reports and people will contact you and they'll say, I'm getting bitten. I think I've got bed bugs, I'm being bitten. So how do we know, how do we find out? Are they, have they really got bed bugs or is it something else? The typical bite pattern of a bed bug is, is rows of, um, of bites, usually on exposed skin. So places where people have their arms outside of the covers, sometimes on their feet. Um, and sometimes it takes the bed bugs a few attempts to find a, a capillary that they can get the blood out of. So you'll often get a line of a line of bites that are quite characteristic. So this is on on a hand. Bed bugs are also pretty messy creatures. So as soon as they've fed, they they will produce a fecal drop almost immediately, even when they haven't finished. For, finished feeding. So this photograph is, is literally the bed bugs feeding at one end and producing feces at the other. This black dot is re a real telltale sign of finding bed bugs in an environment. So bed bugs often produce this, these, these ink-like spots. So it's a real, and it, it's found on the bed, it can be found on the bed sheets. Less so in hotels because, because the beds are being changed so regularly, it's quite difficult to find them on hotels, but if you look at the soft furnishings that are there permanently, you can often find, find um, evidence of bed bugs. They're pretty dirty creatures. It's really important that you confirm your indications with a visual inspection. So you might not always be able to find the bed bug, particularly in the hotel industry where there's often um, 
a low low infestation level. So you might only have maybe 10 bed bugs in a room. Um, and so looking for those telltale signs means a, a real sense of detective work. So where do we find bed bugs? Where, where, where are they in, in an infestation? So bed bugs like somewhere with a bit of protection. So often the, the best places to look for bed bugs are in those in the screw holes in beds. They like they don't like shiny surfaces. They find it really, really difficult to, to move on a shiny surface. So, so you're looking for rough surfaces, probably underneath the bed. They'll be in the trim. They'll be in the trim of they'll be in the trim of the um, mattress quite often. If there's an encasement, then you, you're limiting the, the number of places that they can be. This one is a particularly bad infestation. So, you know, if you work in kind of social housing areas, you might come across this where, um, and, and quite often it's where the infestation has spread outside of a, a, a starting infestation. And, is, and it's been found by other tenants in um, uh, multi-occupancy buildings. So the person who's, who's got the severe infestation may have uh, limited mobility. They may have poor mental health. They may have other social issues going on, which means that they don't have the capacity or una are unable to kind of cope with the fact that they've got an infestation. Quite a lot of people, and particularly elderly people, don't, don't um, re react to the bed bug bite. So they might be oblivious to the fact that they've got a problem. So it might be that when you come in, you're quite shocked by the kind of level of infestation that you find. Quite often, the bed bugs are found underneath. So if you look at this picture, this is the underside of the bed. The bed bugs like to squeeze under, underneath in a little gap. They don't need very much space. It's probably two to three millimeters of space that they need to find a crevice. And that means when you're doing your searches, when you're looking for, for bed bugs, you're looking for really little, little kind of nicks in the wood. Um, you're looking for rough surfaces where they can get a little bit of protection. Um, and, and underneath the edge on the headboard, so that's a really frequent place to find them. But again, you can see these fecal marks. They are hard-bridge in, in a mix of ages. So you'll have uh, females, you'll have males, you'll have large nymphs, so this is fifth instar, you'll have eggs and you'll have first incisors, and they will leave their exuvia. So you can see the exuvia here. And these often stick to furniture. Even in a hotel room, sometimes you can find these have fallen off onto the floor behind the bed. It's all about that really good detective work to find out where they are. They'll use pher pheromones to find each other. So, they'll, so, so in these harborages, they'll put down aggregation pheromones. Um, and so you often find bed bugs in clusters of you know 20 to 30 if they found a good good location. And here's a close-up of the cast skins just to get an idea. So they those change in size obviously with the knit as they shed them as they change through their nymphal stages. So a question that we frequently get at the bed bug foundation is well how long can a bed bug survive? without food. So we've we've had um we had a setup that we did for a company where we infested it with bed bugs and they kept it for about 15 months and they contacted us and asked us to replenish it with bed bugs and set it up again. And we discovered that this this particular this particular um demonstration um had been kept in a cold place. It had been kept away from people. These were lab strain bed bugs. So they were, they were bed bugs that don't exhibit any resistance um, and they lasted for 15 months. So bear that in mind when you're looking at places where you're, you're treating is that it might be that the bed bugs are, you know, really hiding, hunkering down. 
The shortest time is about six weeks without feeding. So our field strains that we have, so we have um, four field strains that we keep at Symex store. Um, if they're at room temperature, if they're regularly being taken in and out, so, so we have our cultures in, in boxes and we'll take them in and out of the out of our cultures. If we don't feed them regularly enough uh, and they're kept at room temperature um, and they've got foraging cues, so there's somebody breathing, they're detecting a host being present, then it, it can be six weeks before they die of starvation. And that's because the cost of resistance is much higher. So in the, the um, enzymes that they need to make in order to break down pyrethroids um, and other insecticides, that, that process requires a level of maintenance. And so you either live for a long time or you fight against you know, whatever threat there is to you. So remember, when you're looking at, at your bed bugs, so think about factors such as temperature, humidity, is there a host present? Because quite often when people have got severe infestations, they'll move out of the bedroom and move, move maybe to sleep on a sofa. And so they're not getting bitten any longer, but the bed bugs are still there. And, and if, the, if the infestation persists for a longer term, then those bed bugs will go from the bedroom and start to migrate to the sofa. So you'll start to get a distribution of bed bugs in unusual places. Um, and obviously the level of insecticide resistance is, is quite key to how long they'll survive. So Richard, my husband, so over many years, I'm a long suffering wife. And so I got to a stage where I was, well, if I can't beat him, I'll have to join him in the business. So about five years ago, I joined him in the business, having occasionally brought his home, his work home. So having firsthand experience of, of knowing what it's like to have bed bugs in your bedroom not an infestation I'll add you know some of these things were deliberate um I just wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor of the kind of research that we're doing so in 2010 Richard worked on on looking at dispersal of bed bugs so he set up an artificial setup um, and he looked at the distribution so how far is it away that bed bugs will colonize if you've got a host present. So he set up this infestation, with, he set up these bed bugs. He had a feeder at one end that you can see here. So he's got his feeder. And then the bed, and there was a strip of paper along the middle here. So the bed bugs could spread themselves out um, and work out. And so what you find is that you don't get an even distribution. So they, they clearly can find each other. So this is where the aggregation firm means come in. And so there's several companies that produce um, synthetic agri uh, synthetic pheromones in an attempt to lure bed bugs into a, into a um, particular place into a monitor so that you can can find them. So they form these little aggregations. Okay, now what's really interesting? Some interesting, you know, if you're talking about things, you need some interesting stories, don't you? Interestingly, bed bugs aren't very faithful. OK, then they don't go back to the same place. They don't really mind who's there as long as there's been a bed bug there before them. I'm not going to say anything more than that, but, you know, that's one of their things. So not satisfied with um, a three metres long arena, Richard took to, so we built two test bedrooms. Um, and so our test bedrooms are set up with a small double bed um, white linen, white walls, um, white headboard, um, and on some nights, about 10 bed bugs. Okay. So we started to release these bed bugs into, into the room, and we, we did five unfed and five, uh, sorry, five unfed males and five unfed females. On the first night, Richard was very certain that he would not get bitten because these bed bugs were going to find it devilishly difficult to get onto the bed. It's a divan style bed with casters. The next morning, we um, uh, have Richard having slept in the book. The next morning, we went on a search for these bed bugs. So we found that 80% of these bed bugs had fed on the first night. Which I, find, which I found staggering 
given that we release them on the floor and let's see if this works. We release them on the floor and you can see, you might find this tricky to see if you're on a phone, but there's little black dots and these are the bed bugs being released on the floor, unfed bed bugs, and they're foraging around in circles, looking for those cues. So here's the pattern of the difference in behavior between a bed bug in an occupied room to an unoccupied room. So you can see that the activity level of an unfed bug in an occupied room is significantly higher than an unoccupied room. We also looked at the distribution of where we found those bed bugs. So on the next morning, we would then map out where we found the bed bugs. So predominantly, unfed bugs were found near the exit, trying to find another host. Perhaps they got lost, they didn't pick up the cues of the person in the bed. Um, and those bed bugs that found were found inside the beds would harbourage as close as they could to the head end of the bed. And we also found that they were on the dark side, so this dark side of the bed. So our window's here, and they'll tend to harbour, you'll get more harbourage on here. Now this is significant because we're looking at what, you, what, where would we position monitors? How do we know, where are we looking? You know, as we've talked earlier in the previous talks today, you know, time is of the essence. So, so knowing your bed bugs, knowing where you're likely to find them means that you can find those signs really quickly. So there's our bed bugs in the trap. And you can see where they've traveled in order to get there over the course of the night. Now we also discovered that the bed bugs are only active for maybe two to three hours in the night. And so this is another significant thing when we're thinking about the residuals of of um, pesticides, of how long is it that our bed bugs are really going to be exposed? Oh, I'm going to skip through these. These are, you know, some of the scenarios where you might find bed bugs. I'm sure you've all got grim pictures somewhere on your phones of light bed bug infestations. From this particular infestation, we collected 800 li live bed bugs just from the bed itself. And it, we just couldn't leave the lady in that situation. So and when we think about the behavior of a bed bug, we need to think about what, they're, what kind of creatures they are. Remember that their evolutionary history is that they are cave dwellers. They follow real simple host host cues, so heat and carbon dioxide. They aggregate using pheromones. Um, they hide near the resting location of a host and they feed once per week. Um, their life cycle is really dependent on temperature and there's no activity less than 13 degrees. So how do we tackle bed bugs? We need to ask ourselves a series of questions like where do they come from? Where in the room are they hiding? Where treatment, where, what treatments have been applied previously? Bed bugs don't like parethroids. So if parethroids have been used on a previous treatment, it's quite likely that your bed bug infestation will, have, will be dispersed. So you might not find signs around the, red, around the bed. You might have to look elsewhere in the room. Um, are there any neighboring rooms that are infested? So is it that actually your bed bugs are coming from elsewhere? Is the bed currently occupied? Has your, has your customer moved out of the bed because they're being bitten? And what, what are the treatment and monitoring options that you have available for that particular situation? So there's a whole host of monitors on the market um, which are based around different ideas. Okay, so we've got the passive monitors. Um, so we've got um, climb-up interceptors, which you put around the base of the bed. So if you've got a wooden bed with legs, you can put those around. So like these ones, um, we would recommend using dark colored ones, because as I said, um, uh, well, bed bugs are photophobic. They're cave, cave dwellers. They haven't got very good, um, eye, um, very good eyesight. And so they'll look for dark shadowy places to be. Um, we've got cardboard monitors. 
um, and we've got the kind of pitfall trap type monitors. Um, we've got active monitors. So we've got um, a natural scout, which has a, a bug scent in it, which has, a, a, sorry, bug scent, another company, dear, oh dear. Um, pheromone in it. So we've got, you know, there's two, there's two on the market currently, pheromones that you can add to your monitors to entice bed bugs into them. We've got the Trapic cardboard style um, glue board. Interestingly, bed bugs, bed bugs are really good at pulling themselves off glue boards. So it's not always an effective monitoring system because they'll come up to it, they'll feel it, and they'll run away. It's the same with some of the pitfall traps, not so much with this one, but they can run around the top here. They don't like falling off edges. So bear those, these things in mind when you're setting up them. This one here releases carbon dioxide to attract bed bugs, um, and this one has a heat pad in it. Now, the thing is, you've got to remember that these, moni so these monitors are good when you haven't got a host in the room, because if you've got a host in the room, 70 kilos of a person is going to be much more attractive than some of the monitors available. The other option which the BBF works in is um, the canine scent detection industry. So the Bed Bug Foundation um, certifies teams. So it's a dog, uh, a canine and a handler that have been trained. And we've recently um, established four new training schools in the UK. So if you were interested in using canines, if as a pest controller, you would like to train a canine in this area, then we do have expertise within the Bed Bug Foundation that would, would help you. The Bed Bug Foundation works across Europe. So we work in France, Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. We have teams that are certified. It's an annual certification. So, so as with um, Mark's talk about, you know, if you're not ready, then there's people out there who can support you. And so knowing, knowing how qualified, knowing what accreditation is out there is really useful. Um, and if you'd like to know a bit more about the Bed Bug Foundation accreditations, um, how to train dogs or anything like that, then please do get in touch. Um, one of the requests from BPCA was to talk about insecticide resistance and whether it really is an issue in bed bugs. Um, I would say yes. Um, bed bugs are particularly good at hiding in cracks and crevices, which means that when you're doing your treatment, you have to be extremely thorough. As with all pests, you know, your professionalism and your thoroughness and your knowing, your knowledge, as Mark said, knowing your knowing about your pest is so, so vital in, in um, combating getting rid of pests. Bed bugs, especially, people want them eradicated. They don't want bed bugs in their beds. They don't want to hop into a bed thinking there might be a bed bug in their beds. So it's really, really important that you know the signs, you know what you're looking for. Those, those, those marks that the bed bugs leave often stay stained on the wood. So, so knowing whether you've got an active um, infestation or one that's that's ended, it can be quite tricky. So we've done some tests looking at exposure time time of professional perisphoid insecticides. So as I said, we've got lab strains that we've had in culture for 40 to 50 years and we've had we've got field strains that have been in culture from between 12 and four months and so from time to time we test our field strains so then uh, on this particular test we took the petri dishes like you saw in the previous slide and we added we put the bed bugs on and then we looked at what the knockdown rate was after um, an hour and then after 24 hours. So with the lab stream, at the end of 24 hours with the pyrethroid insecticide, we had 100% knockdown. With our field stream, we only had 85%. And so that 15% is, is resistant to pyrethroids. And that means that 15% is going to go on and breed and lead to more resistance in the population. So whilst 85% seems good, we just have to be aware that actually there are other measures that we're going to need to take. Direct spray is effective, but the residual effect of, of perisroids is less in our field populations. So what can I do? What other measures can I take? Um, sealing, you know, 
encouraging people to seal the holes in their, their um, bed frames um, is important. That could be a useful technique. Um, we unfortunately did have an infestation with our, in our children's beds that went undetected for a while and was much more significant than I realized at the time. And so we took apart the beds um, to look for signs. And these are the signs that we found. Um, and and we even after six weeks of them being, we even took apart the um, silicon and even after six weeks, there were still some living bed bugs in there. Um, so what are our options other than, than using chemicals? So we've got steam treatments are quite effective, but again, it comes down to thoroughness. You've got to do all of those seams and rid ridges along the sides here. Heat treatments are very effective. Um, and there's a lot more bubble treatments being done for low level infestations. Again, you need to be well trained in this. You need to make sure that you're getting to the right temperatures. So um, the lethal temperature for a bed bug is 48 degrees. If you go much higher than that, you start to get problems with the structure of the building. So it is real specialist, specialist work. Um, and again, you've got to watch out for cool spots. It's possible that if you haven't got fans running and you're not getting the whole area, so you need you do need that equipment, the monitor, the temperature monitors, in order to check the cold spots, the places where the heat will find it difficult to penetrate to make sure that you don't end up with cold spots, that you don't end up with clusters of bed bugs. Um, other useful tools are bed bug blue, which is which is good for knowing whether the fecal spots are in fact bed bug and not not spider or um, or uh, fly fecal spots. Um, encasements are really useful. I've gone over time. I must have gone way over time. I'll I'll wrap up in a minute, John. Um, encasements are really useful because you can put your um, limit the number of harbourages in the bed, and it means that the bed bugs will be pushed out of the bed, it, it saves you on your search time. There's proactive search solutions like NaturoSafe, which, um, and I think it's now in the UK as insectotape. So this started out in Sweden. Um, and that's, that's a preventative measure. So it's designed to create a perimeter to prevent bed bugs getting into the bed and therefore not feeding and therefore reducing the population. Um, uh, desk and dusts, um, DE, silica, silica dioxide are effective as a residual. Um, I don't believe Cymex is licensed in the UK currently. Um, and just to finish off, is it really bed bugs? At the foundation, we get a lot of calls and a lot of emails. And um, quite often, you know, a member of the public thinks they've got bed bugs, but actually it's not bed bugs at all. So it's really important to kind of know what time of year it is. Could it be mosquitoes? Could it be bird mites? Could it be fleas? Um, do they have other skin complaints? Or could it be delusional parasitosis? I know there was an article in the, one of the magazines quite recently about what to do about del delusional parasitosis. Um, go through that. One of the most frequent, frequently confused species is carpet beetles because they often cause people to have rashes so it looks like bed bug bites um, and, and incidentally um, canines so the scent detection industry sometimes the canines will find carpet beetles they can find them quite interesting so if the dog hasn't been trained not to pick up on carpet beetles sometimes they can indicate on carpet beetles and not bed bugs so if at any point you have something that you think might be a bed bug, you know, you have, you're not able to magnify it well enough, it visually looks a bit like a bed bug, then you're more than welcome to send a photo to us at the, the um, Bed Bug Foundation. Richard is surprisingly good at identifying species from parts of the body. I don't know how he does it. Oh, insect body. Oh, I'll just clarify. Um, from the insect body. Um, and yeah, so if you need any support with that, then please do get in touch.
So thank you very much. I hope I didn't talk too quickly. Um, but and if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. That was amazing. Thank you very much. I uh, I was like glued to the screen. <laughs> can't, can't get away. <laughs> Um, and if you hadn't said it was your first time, I don't think anyone would ever notice. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. It, it was really enjoyable. Um, just got a few questions. There's quite a few in there, so you might need to go in and type some. Okay, answers. okay. Uh, but I'm going to pick out the sort of those yeah, two that were repeating, as it were. Yeah, go on. Um, smooth surfaces. Will they be able to climb like inside a cupboard? Um, you know, like the laminate. On oh, the like the, so, like melamine. Yeah. Um, no, no, they won't. So, so usually in, in, in wardrobes and things like that, if you've got bed bugs higher up, it's probably because they've come in on people's clothing. That tends to be what's happened there. Yeah, I think the, so, the question was around bed bugs getting from a bed into someone's wardrobe and then infesting the clothing, as it were. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, that would only happen if if the bed bugs have been dispersed in the room. So if if a treatment or if people have tried to treat it themselves and they've actually dispersed it, then you could, could end up with them in the wardrobe. But, but I would say it is very easy for people to have an infestation for quite some time before they realize it. And that, you know, from my own experience as someone that works with bed bugs on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it was quite shocking when our sons had bed bugs in their beds. Yeah, I imagine. I, I don't know how your <laughs> husband slept in a bed knowing that there was bed bugs there. Like, sometimes <laughs> struggling in hotels at the best of times. Um, uh, and there was a question that a couple of people asked this around reactions to bite. One was, uh, why do the elderly react uh, less to it? I don't know entirely why, but, but often... As you get older, your immune system is less reactive. So that's that's why, you know, COVID, et cetera, um, people are more susceptible. So it's just because of the weakened immune system. So it's just it's just the sensitivity of old, old age, really. And people can react differently. So if like a couple was in a bed, one could be showing signs. And yeah, one, yeah. You know, might women, not. women tend to get bitten more than men. So one theory is that generally speaking, and I don't, you know, want to make any gender statements that are inappropriate, but men tend to be more hairy than women. And therefore it's harder for the bed bugs to bite men because climbing over the hairs is a little bit of hard work. I'll not have a sh I'll not shave the bird off anytime soon then. No, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Super. There are a few more in there, Lexi. If you could pop into the question section and just type like yeah, sure. that, that would be awesome. Yeah, Thank I will do. Much. Great. Thank you very much.